Morning, everybody. I'm Helen Buckingham, Director of Strategy at the Nuffield Trust, and I really want to welcome you back to, to day two of our annual summit. Um, I think most of you were here yesterday. Welcome, an extra welcome to those who've arrived this morning. I'm not even going to attempt to summarise the, the full richness of yesterday's discussions. I mean, it was really clear from the buzz all the way through the day, late into the night, and indeed this morning as well, that we are really succeeding in the aims that we have when we, when we put this summit together of connecting interesting people and stimulating some great thoughts. Um, Thea highlighted three themes when she did her presentation yesterday morning around um, the, the need to create psychological safety and productivity, which were also themes for, for the summit. And they were about trust, openness, and relationships. And it seems really clear to me that in the conversations that you're all having yesterday and today, we absolutely feel those three things in the room today, which is, is brilliant for us. Um, and we know that buzz is going to, to continue today in our sessions this morning. Um, a bit later on this morning, we're going to hear about changing attitudes to, to work in the workplace. Before that, we're going to be discussing complexity and uncertainty in the health and care system. But one thing is absolutely certain. The health and care system is unbelievably reliant on the contribution of the women who work in it. The huge proportion of the women in both the health system and the care system at every level. Uh, and today, of course, is International Women's Day, so we really wanted to, to mark that contribution of the women in the system and acknowledge, too, the support that, that we, you know, all of us, have received from the men as allies who've supported us in that journey. But, you know, join me, please, in celebrating all the women in the health and care system today. I want to, to thank again our sponsors, Optum and Lilly, and our media partners, the BMJ. Um, and I want to thank all of you for everything that you've done to make the, the, the event today so successful and will continue to do. Um, I want to, to highlight to you that today we are publishing the first of our, our, our election briefings. Our contribution to the national debate that is really taking off now as we run up to the, to the next election. And you can pick up copies of that in the, um, in the coffee lounge. Uh, and now, without any further ado, as they say, I'm going to hand over to Professor Claire Goodman, who's going to start us off this morning. So okay. thank you. Well, thank you so much, and I'm uh, really pleased to be here. And as you see from the title, we're taking forward the conversations yesterday that were about risk, about how people work together, and about how the culture and language. And we've put risk and uncertainty together. And we're now thinking about health and social care, but also, crucially, what that is when you are actually traveling through the different systems. And trying to have an emphasis on what works. And I have a great mentor, Steve Eiliff, who, if you're old enough, you'll remember as an academic GP. And he once memorably made this, the comment, he said, at the end of the world, there will be cockroaches and two people arguing about integrated care. Um, <laughs> and so I think, <coughs> so if we can <coughs> focus on the positive, please, and, and, and actually, we've got a fantastic panel who, ha who can draw on experiences and principles to work with. My own research is at the interface between health and social care. And when I was talking to Natasha about this session, I was saying it's the uncertainty that people hold as part of their work. It's not just risk, and, maybe, and I hope we will have a debate. It's an uncertainty about whether this decision is going to work for the person whether the interpretation of the data is correct for this person. Um, also, who gets to make the decision, who gets to be heard about the decision, and finally, who, whether the resource, once you've achieved that, is there for you. So these are the kind of uncertainties that are part, that have to be held at every stage of um, supporting people who are living with complexity and multimorbidity. So I'm going to hand over straight away to Clinton, who is an expert on these issues, and uh, invite you to bring your perspective to it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, I'm often referred to through the, uh, the health lens as someone who has comorbidities. Uh, and comorbidities to me um, mean um, each has a distinctive, vibrant piece of 
health puzzle. And each condition not only uh, stands alone with its unique uh, challenges, but once woven and woven into a greater patchwork for my well-being. And I often talk and use the analogy of uh, well-being, what it means to me, to live um, a glorious, ordinary life. So um, my health and the social care system, their role should be to enable me and facil facilitate me to live my glorious, ordinary life. And what I, for me, if we look at the puzzle as the analogy, so managing uncertainty in health and social care is that puzzle of complexity. In, in my, and on reflection, on my experience, and especially the experience of being missed diagnosed um, and I, I was perceived to uh, have an imposition on uh, health and uh, social care time and I had to go through constant um, tests and it was, wasn't picked up of some of the issues that I, I had and um, this made me feel less trusting of uh, the health and, and social care and not seeing me in the round of, you know, um, my uh, co-mobilities is more than the individual strands that I am, not seeing me as a whole person. So uh, it bred mistrust. Uh, and, uh, uh, and for me, it's essential to understand who I am, my uh, dreams, wishes, preferences, and um, often I'm misunderstood and only seen through that lens of my, my condition. So, but often for me, it's about how do you understand what matters most to me, my history, and how I want to live my life. And some, um, some of the issues for me is not just my physical health, it's my emotional health. Uh, health as, uh, as well and often it's not seen it's seen in isolation so for me trust is the keystone of the puzzle for, uh, for me so you need to um, you need to understand the complexity of how I live my my life so you have to get the whole story as far as I'm concerned and it, um, by doing that it helps build a, bi a bigger and richer picture of who Clinton is with this Brummy accent and, uh, uh, you know, Windrush parents and, you know, my football team means a lot uh, uh, to me. But it's about understanding that richness of that story and how I interact with the services around me. But um, also it's about collaborating and getting content with me um, it's about understanding how I fit and the system fits in with the bigger puzzle of trying to live my life. But for me, um, I've had issues through the, the system of, um, you know, my, uh, my consultant and my GP altering my medication without even uh, talking to me and then realising it has a knock-on effect on other conditions. That has left me feeling that I'm in position on uh, the, the system and also lack of trust because I feel that I'm being done to, not, you know, with or alongside, you know, uh, the professional knows best. That has issues for, for me for how I fit in the bigger picture of, you know, shared decision making or Sometimes we would call it in social care co-production. You know, I, I feel that my uh, views and wishes are not taken on board. Also, for, for me, it's about how we go about within the system to complete the picture and the, the approach that is used to try and understand uh, what I want out of my health and well-being. But we often just see it through the lens of an illness model, 
but um, what would it be like from a well-being model and what the role of the different uh, you know, puzzle pieces does to enable me to live my glorious ordinary life. And that's basically what it means to me. So can I just ask, are there questions that would, that are not being asked that would help bring that to the fore? For me, yeah. Um, it, a, a simple question, what matters most? <laughs> you know, um, I've never really asked, you know, um, what, what do I do in work? My GP has never asked me, you know, he, there's an assumption that all I do is come to the GP surgery and that's it, and I, I stop at home. He's never asked, what do you do? <laughs> you know, and I, I find that quite, you know, amazing. You know, building a relationship is really important, I think, not just a transaction <laughs> that you're com coming in, it's my big, big toe or it's my eye, just looking at my eye, not asking about the rest of me. So uh, it's really interesting because I'm currently working on a study that's looking at how you link social care data and health data um, together. And one of the things that, for care homes, and one of the things that we've been wrestling with is that none of the systems measure quality of life. Um, and quality of life is not there as the starting point for the conversation. And of course, as researchers, we want a standardised, good, reliable measure. Um, so, so something that moves towards that um, it would be um, is what we're hoping for. But again, then you have to have a shared understanding of what um, your description of what matters to you is that people will also value. Uh, absolutely, but the only way to do that is have time okay. to build up uh, yeah. that relationship to get the, the bigger picture of who Clinton is or uh, other people who draw on care and support. Uh, you know, what matters? And often it's that time uh, um, is not there. You know, and we, I understand the systems under pressure with, uh, with time, but it's human beings. We're not Amazon parcels that are, you know, um, being just dropped off. And that's how it feels sometimes. It can feel um, depersonalised that, you know, come in, you've, you know, sometimes they don't even look at you. In, you know, what is it that you want? You want a, a prescription and then you're out. And I'm, I just feel that it would be great to be listened to, actively listened to. Do you have any, before I come on to Melon, do you have any examples of where you have been listened to that we could? I, um, I've been um, listened to really well with my uh, new GP when um, I, um, I know my body, uh, I need steroids and I could see the symptoms coming and he trusted me so much that I could phone and I said, I, I can feel it's coming on. And he, you know, um, I didn't have to go through the gatekeeping uh, situation to come in, he, he, he sorted it out and it was that's because of the trust and the relationship that was built up. Okay, so I think we'll probably return to that about how we, how we get that for everybody. So Melanie, can I come to you and talk about your, from these issues that have started with Clinton, but also in terms of trust and relationship and uncertainty? <laughs> I think the starting place is about, well, whose uncertainty, complexity and risk is it? So I think Clinton's given a nice intro into that conversation. So social care is hugely diverse. So people that we support range from an older adult in prison with dementia um, coming to the end of a lifelong sentence. It might be um, a 21-year-old with autism in a secure hospital. It could be um, an older adult being supported at home with a package of support. Um, it could be a working adult, adult with a mental health issue with a peer support worker and a personal assistant supporting them to work in the way that um, Clinton's described. So it's broadly diverse. And the people that support us in doing that are diverse too. So that ranges from peer support workers, personal assistants, highly qualified professional social workers or occupational therapists working in secure settings. So in order to us to understand that complexity and lead that, I think it starts with a conversation. So I was asked over breakfast, what's the thing that um, leaders can do 
to support that kind of managing complexity. I said to stop thinking we know what the answer is and to listen and engage. And I think you know, Thea gave a wonderful introduction about how we need to start with that conversation, the engagement and understanding, rather than making assumptions that we understand what those issues are. So that would be about one of the things, Claire, that I would add in that works. Um, the leadership bit's really important. So um, I think as leaders, we don't always model that at uh, um, uh, uh, system levels, do we? So I spend a lot of time in national conferences or in my system leadership chief executive calls back into you know, my role into Nottinghamshire. And we don't model that we, we're listening and engaging necessarily when something goes wrong. Very quick to start looking at what the headline says about what the problem is and to diagnose or to think that a social care provider has no value to add to a conversation because they're not... You know, they're not at the same level as an NHS trust. We think, you know, think certain models are service first. So the thing I think we can really do is to start to think about modelling that ourselves. Um, so in Nottinghamshire, we've got a brilliant piece of work about making every adult matter. So this is about we're recognising that the risk to some people is about dying. So if you're street homeless, um, with substance um, use problems, drinking too much alcohol, mental health concerns you're likely to be dead before you reach the age I am. So your healthy life expectancy is about 21. Your life expectancy is 42, 43 in Nottinghamshire. There's huge risk there. If we're not supporting that adult well, they won't have a life at all. So regardless of a, a quality of life, um, Claire. So we're starting to think about how do we work differently across organisational boundaries to resolve that. So we have a practitioner MDT that involves whatever the, the service might be that person's working with. That could be about somebody that's frequently attending A&E, so we have a colleague from acute hospital there. It may be about their substance use work and mental health work. We have an MDT, a practice level, thinking, OK, what do we need to change to enable that person not to be a DNA who never gets an intervention, um, somebody that can actually just um, control the substance use enough to have a, a bed to sleep in that night because of the, the substance use. And then we model that right throughout. So we're committed as leaders to working in that way and challenging um, ourselves about what we can do differently. But we also have a strategic MDT. So this isn't strategic as in leadership. This is about the next tier up. So what's the management response to that? How do we change contracting? How do we change our thresholds without a conversation that escalates into being, no, we can't because of all of this threshold and risk? So that's another example of how we can manage uncertainty in very practical ways. And I think the last thing I wanted to say is that that trust can be quite fragile, so it takes a huge amount of constant effort. So being mindful of that and everything that we're doing and modelling, I think, is one of the things that we can do as leaders. So I'm interested in the idea of the, the trust underpins this, which picks it, so in, t in terms of... The, and that's across different organisational boundaries. Can you just say a little bit about how, how long it took to get to that place of where people were willing to... To not say, not my job, yours. We're not there yet. All right, OK. <laughs> so we're, no way are we there yet at all. So this is like a small seed. And we've got other examples across other um, areas of work, if you like. And I'm, I'm not going to be talking about hospitals, so I won't mention our transfer care hubs in detail. But it takes a, a huge amount of time, and we're not quite there. And for people to be working with each other in different ways is, is, is so different. So if you think about trusting, um, as Clinton said, the person to, to have a view or a personal assistant who is barely on minimal wage, has only got GCSEs as their main qualification, their competence is about walking in somebody's shoes, advocating for them about what works and helping them to be heard. You're having a conversation with somebody like a, a colleague like Adam next to me, highly qualified, highly skilled, highly experienced. So it takes time to get those two positions to work in harmony together. So it's an ongoing um, piece of work. And can I just... I'm hearing already it takes time. It, and what could be lost then? Because if you're going to have to create time and space, something will have to go. I think it's that conversation yesterday about productivity. So all of us are under huge amounts of pressure. So um, my colleagues will say to you that I'm obsessed about undertaking statutory duties, statutory reviews, making sure our safeguarding work is progressed. There's a real need to be ensuring that we're dealing with the most risk and, and the volume. But it's about holding some leadership space and realising that if we get things right the first time, that is how we're productive, actually. And that does take a bit of time. So, you know, an extra bit of time today certainly saves time tomorrow. But that takes a degree of confidence and leadership to support colleagues to feel that's OK. OK, thank you. So, 
Now I'm going to come on to Sarah and with your hat of looking at the whole local system. So, so I'm, talk to I'm Sarah Wollaston, I chair Devon Integrated Care Board, NHS Devon as we call it, and uh, we're one of the most challenged systems in the country. But even within that system, there's huge variation, and part of our system where it functions the best is the integrated care organisation in Torbay. And there's very stark differences in our no criteria to reside uh, in different parts of our system. And, and I think that what strikes me is that it's the integration that happens closest to the individuals that makes the difference, and that's what you can get within an integrated care organisation. And thinking differently about how you use your funding. So we have, for example, a community inreach uh, team in Torbay, where a very experienced um, occupational therapist who's worked within the system and has trusted relationships across the whole patch, including the VCSE, um, will actually be going in. She's, in her, she's paid for by the ICB, but actually her contract is with the ICO. And, uh, and actually, it's about that time. So she spends the time going into hospital and talking to, to individuals about it's their risk to take. Um, so who, whose risk is this? And for people who have capacity, they're very well used to balancing those risks. But it's about the time, as you said, the time to understand what matters to them, to have those conversations, but also the time to be talking to staff on the ward who, are, um, who, who do worry about the blame, the issues that we discussed yesterday. Will they be blamed if they send somebody home when everything isn't in place and perfect? Well, actually, for, for the individual, it, they are coming to real harm sitting on that ward. And we, we tend to see all this through the lens of risk elsewhere, rather than actually seeing the risk to them as an individual and having the time to have those conversations about that balance. Um, but but the, the real barriers to this are the time, um, and everyone's hugely pressured, but also the turnover, which I think is a real issue in both health and social care, because you have to keep having those conversations again and again um, to establish that practice, because the team on the ward might have changed, um, or you might have <coughs> a lot of temporary staff on the ward. So I think building those relationships isn't a one-off, it's an ongoing uh, process, and it does take time, and it does take just changing your mind mindset about this being about the individual in front of you. We, ha we had a question yesterday, and I think it's absolutely right that this is a safe place for people to ask challenging questions, but one of the questions that was posed was, should we be asking individuals about whether they're concerned about the risk to people in the community who need their bed? Uh, um, actually, it, no, <laughs> um, because people already feel bad enough, as, as you so, so eloquently put it, about you know, feeling like uh, you know, that they're, they're somehow not, it's not personal about them. Uh, so, of course, we, I, I don't believe we should be asking people and putting that to them. It should be entirely about, um, about what matters to them, having the time for those conversations, and, of course, huge barriers around capacity and funding uh, within our social care system and the total imbalance, um, the, the inequity uh, that we see across that system. So, it's coming across very strongly about having time and mm. time, time to have the spaces to talk with each other across boundaries with the people who are the recipients of the service. Um, I'm reflecting on, I did a study where I could see two exactly the same systems of where the NHS was working with social care in one, mm -hmm it was a very negative narrative of healthcare going in to sort something out. And in another, so they had the same resource, they had the same professionals, but they were working to a, with the same goals, reducing unplanned admissions, but they had a different narrative. Um, and what uh, Ken Rockwood has described as sometimes you put in an intervention, well, he was talking about frailty, but says, but when you put in an intervention where the motivation is hostile, care of where you're trying to stop people mm. just imposing on your system and pushing them back into either their home or into the care home. And I just wonder in your organisation, how do you give, mean that, how do you help the narrative that this is exactly what you've been describing? How do you change, because you could, these people could be doing the same thing but have different 
outcome. Yes, that's right. And I think you just have to look at where it works and why it works. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm very clear in my own mind that it works best when you don't frame this as individuals being a problem because we're in that bed, but where you frame it as the real harm we're doing to individuals and, and we see it entirely from, from the risk to them from, from being there rather than it being a problem uh, for the system. Thank you. Now I'm going to come on to Adam as the okay. geriatrician. And yeah, so Claire said I had about five minutes to give a spiel on anything I wanted, and I was trying to work out how to organise this. not say that. Is that not what you said? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, and I'll, I think I'll organise it under three headings. One is pandemic, uh, two is about um, social care literacy in healthcare professions, particularly doctors. And the third is something around uh, competencies and how we share those competencies across uh, the, the, the spaces. Uh, pandemic, massive pressure test for the health and social care system. Um, it brought out the best and the worst in collaborative working in social care. And if you want to see the worst, you just need to look at some of the things that happened in the first wave of the pandemic. I have personal experience, we have research evidence of care homes, of care organisations, domiciliary care providers that put in place the policies that we would subsequently ask them to put in place eight or nine months later in the second wave during March of 2020 and were shouted down by the healthcare system. It's processes around isolation, processes around um, uh, ch uh, checks on, on, on residents' health and well-being and social care, clients' health and social being. Uh, 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 clients' health and well-being and domiciliary care. And we're not allowed to come to the table. And what they were trying to say was that we understand our sector, we understand our clients, we understand the people we work with, and we think we know from looking at what's happened in Italy because we understand the parallels in their system to our system in a way that you, healthcare people, do not, what we need to do. And they were shouted down. Okay. Now, how much of that wave of mortality of deaths in care homes during the first wave was avoidable is an, you know, a kind of um, object of ongoing discussion. But it's clear that we would have done things differently if we'd listened to social care. But also from the pandemic came some really fantastic examples of really innovative working. Yeah? So I remember at one point um, um, using some research money, but working with care homes in the East Midlands uh, 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 during uh, June and July of 2020, where care home staff were doing PCR tests, before we had lateral flow tests, doing PCR tests using experimental technology in the day room of the care home in order to do whole home testing. Yeah? And that came from them. They said, you show us the technology, we'll learn the skills, we'll go off and do that. Yeah. Later in the pandemic, we had examples of parts of the country where social care colleagues were helping to support domiciliary oxygen, support intravenous fluids in some parts of the country. We were rewriting uh, long-standing uh, governance frameworks and pathways on the hoof with uh, around a shared agenda, around a shared understanding, uh, and with the recognition that when we had a shared agenda and shared understanding, we could uh, share responsibility and work together. So the pandemic showed us the worst in collaborative working, and it showed us the best of collaborative working. Slight change of tack, putting my clinical hat on. Um, there's a real issue with social care literacy amongst the healthcare professions, particularly doctors. One of the most common uh, reasons for me being asked to see a referral in hospital is by a specialist colleague who has determined that there's no cardiological, surgical, gastroenterological intervention required and the patient either needs complex discharge planning or a social sort out, whatever a social sort out is. I'm not, do you know what a social sort out is? You can work it out. You can work it out. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, you know, two examples from the, recent, uh, from the last couple of weeks. I asked to see a patient on the surgical ward, no, uh, oper no operable surgical problem, social sort out needed. And it was, I thought, but I didn't have the absolute degree of certainty that this patient was dying from an inoperable cancer. And what they actually needed was a diagnosis and a prognosis. And with that diagnosis and prognosis, my social care colleagues, working with community health care colleagues, could step in and provide the care package that the patient need. I, I simply needed to pick up the phone to my surgical colleague and say, what is the diagnosis here? And how long do you expect this patient to live? And within a very few hours, they were heading off home. Another example in the emergency care department of a patient who'd come in, having fallen at home, 
home, had had a CT scan to the head, had had blood tests and was about to be admitted to a medical admissions unit, despite them having no obvious reversible medical pathology because we couldn't find a discharge pathway for her to go home from hospital back into the community with. And when we sat down and phoned around the various teams and said, what's the problem? Why can't she get home? The answer was, well, if she had a diagnosis of dementia, which is what everybody thinks she's got, then we could get her home in a right pathway. And I said, OK, she's got dementia. And she was home within a couple of hours. Okay. Now, I wasn't making that diagnosis up. It was that all the evidence was there, but nobody understood what the system needed in order to take the next step. And that is reflected in my clinical practice over and over again. Healthcare professionals assuming that um, their bit's done, the sort of other social care, they'll somehow sort that out without realising what they need to bring to the table. And that brings me to the last kind of uh, topic, which is, and I'm watching my time, which is around uh, 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 competencies. And we've been doing a piece of work recently around what are the competencies that a medical professional requires to work in care homes. We published an article in the Asian Aging Journal about this at the beginning of the year. And it's quite interesting when you work back from care home residents and actually look at what people need to know rather than working forward from what particular um, medical disciplines already know, you discover that there's, there's quite a lot of general practice in there, there's quite a lot of geriatric medicine in there, there's quite a bit of palliative care, there's some old age psychiatry. None of those current groups of doctors currently has the whole skill set to provide the health care support needed for people that live in care homes. And most of them have no specific training in how care homes operate as systems or how to build relationships or work in a constructive way with a care home team. Some of them get it through experiential learning, lots of them don't. And I was sitting with uh, care home colleagues in Nottinghamshire on Wednesday talking about this issue of, of, of medical competency. And I said, look, I could think of lots of things that you as care home staff could potentially be taking from healthcare and doing, but I understand that you work in a very resource, uh, uh, an intensive resource pressure system as we do. How do we, how do we square this cycle? How, how, how do we have this discussion? And their, their thing was, well, uh, first of all, uh, you know, if the task moves, the resource for that task in terms of the money has to move with the task. That's important. We can't have health divesting itself of responsibilities and social care picking that up without the resource. Secondly, people need the training in order to be able to do this. And the last thing is be mindful of the opportunity cost. Yeah? So if you're working in a care home and you take a health-centric view of that, you could very quickly come to the, the, the kind of um, uh, uh, sense that by far the most important thing is dealing with Mrs Smith's pressure sore. But if you take a more holistic view of that, you actually realise that the cup of tea and the trip to the garden or even the trip to the garden centre that you're doing with Mrs Smith is an important opportunity cost and you can't stop doing one to start doing the other. You need to make sure that as the resource flows across, you're mindful to the opportunity cost and social care as you add in a healthcare ingredient. So that's some broad reflections in less than seven minutes and I think I've stayed roughly on target. Thank you. Clinton, you were shaking your head at one point. I right, just wondered if you could, come, <laughs> you could come back a bit. I just... The language... It's just okay. yep. uh, 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 um, for me, and it also, when we talk about um, managing the pressure or managing demand, that depersonalises the individual because it can be seen as a burden uh, of, of need and burden on the, on the, on the system. So, f for me... We have to start about, if we're talking we want to be more relational trust, it's about, for me, it's about being more human. And if we're going to be more human, we've got to reframe it from managing demand, because that's what the system does. It manages demand. It doesn't enhance mm -hmm. uh, um, well-being, you know, or creating a system that's responsive to the social... Uh, support and needs that not everyone lives in a care home or a nursing home. You know, some uh, a lot of care is done behind people's front door at homes. You know, the system has to be more responsive to enhance what I s said at the beginning about I want to live a glorious, ordinary life. So how does the system enable me and many others to do the ordinary things that many of you in this room take for granted. Thank you. <laughs> Get sorry. And of course, I absolutely agree. And the real challenge we have in a system like Devon, which is in the highest level of oversight, special measures, whatever you call it, and it's been like that for 10 years. And I know there's a lot more that we could do in Devon to support people to live glorious, ordinary lives. 
if we could put more funding into our community-based organisations. But every penny we spend is scrutinised and every financial decision we make over a really very small amount has to go through quite a complex approvals process. So how do we get the money and that real challenge of how we make the shift from our acutes to our communities to enable that to happen, I think is the real conundrum we face because, because of the financial challenge. But we want to do it. <laughs> and how do we sustain the examples we've had of working mm. well and don't just see them disappear with your GP or disappear with that project, which is what we see. I'm interested in this idea of needing more time. I'm going to open this up shortly. And, and I, as you were talking, I, was, I, I did my PhD and I, right at the beginning of the purchaser provider split, for those of you who can remember it. And I, and I, uh, work, I followed district nurses um, and was working alongside them. And it, as a young PA, or younger PhD student, I was really puzzled that district nurses, as we were approaching the health centres, started jogging. Uh, we'd be walking, we'd get out of the car, and then they would start jogging. And they would run into the health centre, and they would be whatever they needed. And I realised that they, this was the only way they could convey to the other people that they were busy. That, they, you know, that if they came in in a sort of very brisk way and, and said, no, 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 I've got to go through, can I just see, you know, the, and this great sense of urgency. We had ambled literally around the <laughs> corner and then suddenly broke into this trot. Um, and I just, you know, and it's a reflection of how every tribe has its way of conveying it's busy and it's important. And these are learnt behaviours that start when you first hit your first work experience. Um, you know, how does somebody who doesn't know what they're going to walk through the door, whether that you would, we were talking at breakfast about the uncertainties of whether there actually was going to be a, a, a dog to deal with uh, alongside the chaos of somebody's life. Well, how do you, how do you convey all that when nobody's seeing what you're doing as well? Um, and we're hearing a really strong message about we need more time, we need to build trust. And I'm just wondering, are there some, you know, is, is there a time also that we need a bit of reflection as to well, where do we carve this time out from? And, you know, I have never been in a multi-professional meeting with someone saying, you know what, I've got all my admin done because I had nobody to see. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that would not be acceptable. That, there would be no permission for somebody to say, you know what, I've got two hours to spare, let's... So I'm quite interested in that and how we have all signed into just the culture of business, which Clinton is describing as then you feel you're imposing on the system, um, the unintended consequence. I mean, I'm not saying people aren't busy. Um, so I just wondered if anybody had any thoughts, and then I'm going to throw this open. I'm looking for, so, yeah, yep. I'm going to throw it open to the room. But any, any reflections or any examples of where you have created time and trust? I think it's about a culture where we're not always busy. So that's what we like to go around saying, that we, yeah, it's, we're really busy, there's no time, we're under financial pressure, we've got lots of risk and uncertainty. And I think that's the leadership challenge. So, I mean, the, I think we have to enable the workforce to carve out the time that it takes to do the job. And doing the job isn't just about getting through <coughs> volumes, it's not just about ticking forms on the assessment. So doing the job well, and the evidence we know, don't we, from programmes like Getting It Right First Time and um, the work we do in adult social care about quality, it, it does, you know, to take that time out, to do the professional networking, the way that Adam described, understanding the competences, does release it, but we need to have that management and leadership confidence. Um, so in Nottinghamshire, we've really invested in our uh, managers, so the senior practitioners and people managing colleagues across integrated teams because we've got some great examples in working primary care in integrated ways we have to invest in that leadership ability for people to recognize that and then not be target chasing necessarily um, as a leader all of the time but that takes a degree of confidence and cultural competence and confidence and permission yeah. yeah okay thank you so i'm going to throw this open now oh already right so if, um so if i could start with jane and then this gentleman next to the suitcase and then <laughs> <laughs> sorry all the men are wearing pale blue or white so it doesn't work <laughs> thank you thank you very much everyone i'm jane townsend chief executive of the home care association 
we represent and support providers of care in people's own homes. Um, this year, I'm also chair of the Care Provider Alliance. Um, all very, very interesting um, conversations. I was very struck by Adam's comment that care providers knew what to do but weren't listened to. And we saw that all over the country. We told our members to take no notice of what the NHS was telling all the government. Because, for example, you know, uh, that we were told in the beginning we didn't need to wear masks for a respiratory infection that was likely transmitted in aerosols. You know, Nobody thought that that was a very sensible suggestion. So everyone was making their own masks and what have you. Um, but in order, at least they were having a conversation with somebody. <laughs> and what our members and, and our, you know, in the Care Provider Alliance are struggling with is even having the first conversation with anyone in an ICS or an ICB. Things are not very well set up for that to happen, and, and it needs to happen at different levels. Um, so, you know, at the lowest level, it's you're not paying my bills, and I can't, I'm not going to keep, keep my business going unless you pay my bills. Um, right through to, well, we've had this really great idea about how we could do things differently. For example, you know, proactive care services are something the NHS is coming up with. Really great idea, but it's all being done by the NHS. How about co-commissioning some home care with that? Or, in, you know, intermediate care. We've, we've had this intermediate care framework, sort of, some of us were involved in the discussions, but it was very much NHS driven, probably politically driven behind the scenes. Um, but you can't just write a service framework and give it to providers and say, do it. It's got to be co-produced. So how can we get social care providers more actively involved in those conversations at different levels in the integrated care systems? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I, I've been uh, working in this space um, for a decade and a half, um, and I've been saying for much of that time, we need to have social care providers around every single table where we are um, uh, uh, having decisions about how to design and um, uh, commission and structure um, anything that crosses boundaries between, between health and social care, right? And even stuff that doesn't cross boundaries, because actually there's some stuff that we're doing in healthcare at the moment that social care would very happily share the burden of if we could have a mature and grown-up discussion about this. Uh, we had a... Not, Nottinghamshire, I think, has actually got quite a good track record of inviting social care people to the table, because we had this discussion a decade and a half ago, and they are around lots of, uh, lots of tables. I think that's a fair comment, mm, yes. Melanie. Um, but I, I get the sense that in lots of other systems, there's still a, a sort of othering, there's still a sort of sense that we are public they are either a third sector or for profit or something other, yeah? And that leads to an element of, of distrust. Um, uh, and, and that often is a barrier. Um, the human relationships, so once they're established, the shared goals, the shared aims, the shared focus around providing care to clients in their own homes uh, or in, in, in care homes, it very quickly brings those barriers um, down. Um, uh, you know, just a, 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 couple of, a couple of very quick, one quick anecdote uh, from the uh, pandemic would be that um, near, near the beginning of the pandemic, a care home manager that I worked closely with for a long time said she was setting up a WhatsApp group for care home managers and domiciliary care staff, and would I mind being on it as a source of medical advice and guidance when they had medical questions? And I said, of, of course, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Um, and after a while, some NHS... Governance people managed to find their way onto this WhatsApp group and started saying to me, well, you know, what governance checks have you had about this? And, uh, you know, are you maybe in breach of some regulations? And uh, uh, maybe we could bring this in-house and get it a bit more controlled and a bit more, you know, uh, corporate. And, and we said, no, the whole point of this is it's addressing the needs of the sector and delivering the needs for the sector. And, and it's still running to this day. So it's now, what, four years old and they're still giving each other advice in that forum. And they don't need me as much anymore because the questions these days are not so medical and about COVID. But there was something about trusting the instincts of what they needed, working with them and not letting the NHS governance the bottom out of it. I don't know if that's a good example, but it's, it's just a, a lived example. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, so some of the tips I would give, Jane, to other the leaders is, so we have social care providers in our transfer of care hubs, both um, care home managers and home care providers. It can't be everybody, but it's a, it's a voice there. Um, uh, one of my social, um, county council seats on the Integrated Care Partnership is a social care, home care provider. 
Um, we, we look to have a, a public health commissioned provider and the ICP as well. So, because I lead on public health as well. So, we've got providers with both of that well being um, and integrated approach in the public health space. So, every opportunity, every table, as Adam says, is looking for that. And then I would suggest for providers is look to your directors of adults to be the person that can have sharp elbows for you. And if you're one of the colleagues in the room being elbowed, just accept that as best intention, actually, for better conversation and to allow those elbows to have you poked. Thank you. OK, so we go to the gentleman by the suit. Yes, yeah, so, uh, hello, John Dean, uh, Clinical Vice President of Royal College of Physicians and a physician in East Lancashire working in a provider, which is an integrated healthcare provider. Um, I want to try and link Chris Whitty's talk yesterday, for those who are here, with some of the discussions we're having, where he talked about uh, the need for us to be specialists and have generalist skills. And part of the work that I'm aiming, trying to lead at Royal College of Physicians is around what are those generalist knowledge and skills in the current context. And I would propose to you that understanding the interfaces that each of us as professionals have and understanding the in inverted commas, other side of that interface is part of our generalist skills that we need to develop. So what are the opportunities and what is stopping us understanding those interfaces better? When I've done service redesign work uh, across any interfaces, whether that's in a hospital or, or, or across boundaries with other, with other sectors, the way people's eyes are open by just physically going and spending one or two hours in the service that they are interfacing with changes their professional practice and their service delivery and yet we seem constrained to create those opportunities so how can we do that is that something we should be doing do you have examples of that is, is my question um, so one, one of the, and i'm going to answer that initially i'm going to set something up for clinton to come come in <laughs> well you could let clinton start first. well clinton do you want to go first I, I, for me, one of the things when we, we talk about the, the, the system and the language we use, and I'm coming back to the language because it's really important for me and it, it sets the value of how we, we are seen. We are often seen as passive recipients of the service. And when I started this talk, I used the term people who draw or call on uh, the service that you provide. That's about the power dynamics and understanding sharing power as equals is really important. And often the conversation is more about if you're not around the table, you're often on the menu. And that's how it feels for, for many people who experiences the, the system. So in the pandemic, I'll give you a quick uh, example. Um, yes, the um, care homes and nursing homes were forgotten. But not many people realised personal assistants um. were forgotten and left behind, had no access yeah. mm -hmm. to uh, PPE. Uh, so, you know, it's about if you do not have that perspective around the table, you are often further disenfranchised those same people you say you want to support and help. Now, in ICBs and ICPs, and it's alphabet soup, as far as I'm concerned, with acronyms that are out there, often the person who draws on care and support is missing from the conversation. It goes through gatekeepers. Now, how do you create a system where the most marginalised of voices can be heard? Not filtered to um, not upset the system, but there are some challenging perspectives out there that are not being heard by the system. Um, so, Adam, do you want to... And then yeah, so yeah, so I mean, uh, I, first of all, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, I, I think Clinton's thing, that his, his question about... Um, what matters to me is, is, is really powerful. And, and actually, if you think about it as doctors, as a geriatrician, I ask that relatively frequently, but maybe not as often as I should. And I think that many of my specialist colleagues ask it even more seldom. Um, and um, 
what they then do when Clinton told them what mattered to him and they go, uh, right, that one I know about, the rest I can forget about and hand on to someone else. And, and I think there is something about how we as, as a profession, as doctors, uh, look at how we ask that question about what matters to Clinton and then we try to work with him to hold more than just that little bit that we think that we've decided is our remit for the day. So there's something about how we have conversations, John, and I think we need to look again at how we teach these things and maybe make them more generalist. Um, I think the, the, the biggest challenge for us as an organisation that represents geriatricians, many of whom want to get out of the acute hospital and go and do more of the interface work as you described, is that at the moment, as, as you know, and as many other people in the room know, acute hospitals are on, are, are on their knees and what they need is generalists too. Um, so we need in some way to proliferate the number of generalists who can both do the acute hospital work but then go out and do the interface work as well. And that might mean some of my colleagues who have decided that they have a narrow remit having to broaden out again. So I agree with Clinton, I agree with Chris Whitty and I agree with you. So Sarah, and then... But just to answer your point, but how do you bring that into boards? Well, we decided in NHS Devon that we, we wanted to have people on our board with lived experience. So when we set it up, we had three people who had direct lived experience of looking after people with very complex needs. And uh, they act as very powerful advocates. But we also realise we need to actually go and meet individuals themselves. So, for example, we'll be meeting next month with um, care leavers. So it's actually bringing people directly directly in to have those conversations. But to go to the wider point about how do we make sure that, uh, that individual clinicians have a real understanding of this outside medical school. Well, certainly when I was at medical school, I, I worked in care homes and uh, that was, and I, th I think that that should be factored in. That, you know, unless you've actually been out there and seen how, how this works in the community, you never really properly understand it. So, so I think that for all of our health professionals, really pushing that actually is really in everyone's, you know, both for you and for the people you'll be looking after or working with in future, understanding how the whole system works by directly working there, um, I think it, it should, be, should be part of the curriculum and it's not prioritised. Um, but I also think it works the other way, that actually allowing people, encouraging people to come and sit on boards and take part. So I think that's uh, really important too. And then I think just the final thing to sort of draw that to a, to a point is to move away from delegating healthcare tasks and social prescribing. So that's a sort of a, a telling, isn't it? It's just about that this is what works and moving towards a quick conversation because a quick conversation can take the same amount of time. So it's moving from that telling others to a sort of position of collaboration. Thank you. Uh, Liz, and then I'll go to the gentleman behind Liz. So, yeah, Liz. Okay. Thank you. I'm Liz uh, from the National Care Forum. We're a not-for-profit um, care and provider support membership organisation. And Jane does an excellent job chairing our umbrella group um, of the Care Provider Alliance. Uh, we generally agree on lots of things. Um, so listening to the conversation today has really reinforced a couple of things for me and then taught me a new term. So we talked... Um, so Thea had her, her three values of trust openness and relationships and I'd like to add a fourth which is respect which is the thing that's underpinning a lot here the power imbalances we've heard from uh, uh, from Clinton about and the power imbalances we've heard from Jane about they're all kind of embedded into the system um, and the folks on the panel are trying to unembed those power structures and kind of make them a bit more democratic and a bit more equal and it strikes me that the shared endeavour point is absolutely the thing that we need all of you in the room to help us with. Um, we don't necessarily know how to get to the right conversations about that shared endeavour. We've been round lots of incarnations of the health architecture um, and we've lost track of all the acronyms and you've had to live it, so I empathise with you. But we need to find a way into that shared endeavour and that kind of conversation of equals. And the point about social literacy, uh, social care literacy, I think is something that I would really like to hear from everybody in the room about what can we do as providers to encourage that uh, social care literacy? And then what will you do with it when you've got it? And how will you embed it? 
uh, and the point from Sarah about the training. Deb Sturdy and I have had many conversations about how to, uh, well, for nursing anyway, how to kind of restructure the way we think about the support that people need and what is it, where do we start? And if we always start in hospitals, we'll always think about hospitals. But actually, the vast majority of care and support happens well away from most institutional settings, actually. And that breadth and diversity of the care and support that people really need to live their best lives is complicated. It is uncertain. It takes a great level of skill and competence to walk into somebody's home every day um, and that person may have quite a wide range of complex conditions and to understand how you're going to best support them that day to do the things that they want to do that day and help them with the things they need that day. It's, it's not predictable. And it, it might not have a label in front of it. It doesn't necessarily have a qualification associated with it. But that is managing uncertainty and risk every day to help people live their best lives. And so it's that kind of social care literacy that I'd really like us to explore and think, well, we've all got a responsibility in that. How do you, what would be your advice to us and to all the leaders in this room who can really make a difference about that? So social care literacy and respect and trust. Sarah, do you want to? Well, social care literacy, I think it, it, it's not a one-off. You have to keep, keep doing, doing this and you have to in, encourage people to get out and meet with people who are doing the job. So that's what I try and do on a personal level is go and meet, uh, but also with carers and with people who are receiving care. So actually the, the, it's not a one-off. It, it's, a, it's a whole system approach and to keep doing it. So I uh, raised there a lot of hands. So, gentlemen, yes. Yes, it's you. Hi, um, uh, Dilly Paliraj. I'm the chief executive of the Richmond Group of Charities, which is a coalition of um, 12 national health charities. And I think um, if we had time, we could do a little field trip down the road to Slough, where there's a really brilliant um, practice run by Priya Kumar, who has created the space and the time for the relationship building to have the what matters to you conversations. And what they've done is that they, instead of just inviting people in for their quality and outcomes framework, annual reviews, they've used um, data tools to risk stratify, to identify the people with the most complex needs. And they've identified the, the segments of their patient population who need the longer appointments, the one, ones with kind of complex multimorbidity um, and they have longer appointments with a GP and the GP is then able to have a more in-depth conversation because you can't have a what matters to you conversation in 10 minutes right that's the, that's the problem there are too many issues in, in someone's lives just to cover it in 10 minutes so you have to engineer longer appointments um, and they've done that despite the financial constraints despite the workforce challenges and i think the problem is that the quaff system incentivizes quite the opposite um, and i think the, the policy makers have to re-engineer quaff so that in, instead of doing this sort of stuff in spite of quaff quaff incentivizes you to focus on people who have the greatest need and to give them the time and space it doesn't guarantee that what matters to you conversation um, but it creates the space to have it. I think that's a really important point about re-engineering, because GPs would ask for more time for everybody, but actually that's, that's saying, as a sort of as an extension of what Chris Whitty is saying, is move, move the services to where the people are, but it's also move the, the mm -hmm. allocation of time to who the people are, uh, is what you've described, and that, that would be... I'm just thinking of all the outpatient departments yep. and things like that, but that would be quite radical. Mel? Yeah, so I think it kind of builds on the other question as well about the, the generalist approach versus specialist. When you actually follow a person into their home and just through a week, the amount of healthcare professionals and social care professionals that enter that person's home, it's a huge amount of time. So re-engineering that into making every contact count kind of model is hugely powerful and that's one mechanism of freeing that up. It does need some leadership and primary care I think can really step into that leadership space and to own that, particularly where we've got areas where we've got that, some of that data integration to risk stratify so we've got some 
brilliant examples of that in Nottinghamshire. But that takes uh, that sort of leap of trust into believing you can free that up. So I went out with one of my adult occupational therapists and we were into a family that had... Um, it, all, everybody in the family had a, a different disability and there was a children's occupational therapist from the, um, the hospital. There was a, a children's OT from the social care piece. There was a physio. I mean, it was just amazing the amount of people that are in the room, in this cramped, tiny living room, reviewing this family's situation. And you just think, wow, well, is that the best way of organising that time to free something up? So you're right, there's no sort of magical answer to freeing it, but we don't really understand without walking and stepping into that, that experience of that person, just how much time is invested in, the, you know, in a way that we can organise and orchestrate much better. So, so, so it's an example of population segmentation. And, and when the electronic frailty index was invented and put in the back end of GP systems, one of the questions that GPs then came back with, and now what do we do now that we've segmented the population? I think your response is actually um, maybe just allow a bit more time you know, for, for people that are at higher risk. And I think that's a really, a really helpful kind of uh, pushback. I think the other thing that's important in the midst of all this population segmentation stuff is not to lose the individual in all of this, because there will be some individuals that don't fall out of the algorithm that aren't, that aren't put in front of the GP that way. But I think, yeah, when people are at high risk, give them a bit more time is a, a very healthy way to answer that question. Thank you. Lady at the back with a bright orange. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you need a mic. Hold up. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so I'm Juliet Bouvery. I'm Chief Executive of the Stroke Association, Chair of the Richmond Group of Charities. So I really welcome this debate because, you know, complexity and uncertainty is here to say we've got older people living with multimorbidity, which is making their needs more complex. But also we've designed the health and care system to be really impossible to navigate for patients. So I wanted to ask a question about care navigators or care coordinators. Um, we've heard from the panel about um, how valued they are by patients. When they're integrated into multidisciplinary teams, they free up clinician time. Uh, they have the time to really understand what matters to patients, to plug them into available support services, to really help them achieve their life goals. And yet I still hear from clinicians that there isn't an evidence base that's strong enough to justify uh, more investment in care coordinators or care navigators. So I'm just interested in the panel's uh, view on what needs to change to really embrace these kind of non-clinical, very person-centred roles uh, that make a real difference uh, to patients' experience and outcomes. So can I just clarify, when you say a navigator, do you mean somebody who helps them through the system or is the advocate for the people within the system. They're often performing both roles. I say it again, sorry? They're often performing both roles. Oh, both roles, OK. Can I just ask Clinton as the sort of your view on that? Uh, uh, it, it, it all depends on the knowledge, the care navigator or what, um, care coordinator or uh, like local area coordination, social prescribing. It all depends on the knowledge uh, of understanding the, the system and um, your rights, you know, it talked about literacy. Legal literacy is a really important aspect, as well as health uh, literacy. But I think it, we need a menu of options. It's not either or, if that makes uh, uh, sense. To, in health and social care, there's kind of a tribalism uh, uh, there when it's, it should be social prescribing against uh, local area coordination and care coordinate. There's loads of different names in the, in the system. Most people couldn't care less as long as you enable them to live their life. And that's, you know, and I'll be interested, what are you measuring for about success? You know, is it, is it measuring for the system or are you measuring for uh, enabling someone to live their glorious ordinary life? Because that's different. So, oh, you were, you did have your hand, sorry, you did have your hand up. Did you want to talk or was it behind you? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll go, sorry, Face we'll go with this, this way and then there are some people and then, all right, we'll go to you, sir, and then we'll come when you've decided which of you is going to answer the question. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Tim Hobbs, Chief Executive of Dartington Service Design Lab, independent research and design charity focused on improving outcomes for, for children. Um, I was really interested, we're doing a lot of work around kind of community-based prevention, particularly in the kind of mental health space, and this conversation around what matters to you, I think, is really kind of pertinent. But I'm interested in the panel's views around 
what can we do or what can system leaders do to elevate that conversation around what matters at an individual or clinical level to a broader system level? So how might we create conditions within a system um, that allows partners across health, community, social care to really kind of better understand um, and open up some of those um, conversations um, beyond health and principally given the really challenging financial constraints within both the health system and within local government, how might we better use existing resources that exist within the system already to have those conversations? Can I take that to you? Because that speaks to what you've been trying to do. I think, I think there were some conversations yesterday, weren't there? I can't remember which speaker, but they talked about reversing the amount of time on um, strategic agendas, They're looking at finance, looking at safety, and I would frame that really as quality, actually. So that's one of the ways that, uh, certainly in some of the strategic forums I'm a member of, we started to look at the individual story. So really starting to test ourselves of what is it we're measuring, what is it we're counting, what is it we pay attention to. Because we all know that, don't we? So whatever we're getting from the top down, whatever our, our top is, about what we're asking to count gets the attention. So as leaders, we need to hold that space and look at other sources of data and evidence. And, and that can be particularly you know, evaluated and measured well, I think, as, as Clinton's challenge about what are we counting. But we do know we can do that from a qualitative perspective. So it'd be one of the ways that I've experienced that that has some impact is you know, being very aware as a leadership group what we're paying attention to in our agendas. So, yes, it's, again, it's, it's what's the dominant narrative then drives everything, I think, is what you're saying. So are you asking the question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. I like it. Uh, I'm Mohammed. Um, I'm a GP. Uh, I'm a clinical director and I'm also a non-executive director of uh, the local hospice. Uh, I found this uh, really, really fascinating, uh, very close to my heart as a GP uh, managing complexity um, and a frail, uh, more elderly population. Um, you'll see in the headlines today that uh, you can't get an appointment for um, uh, to see your GP. Uh, which I think is uh, not the case everywhere. Uh, you can see us uh, in our surgery. And there will be I a promise. surgery after this meeting. <laughs> 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 um, but, you know, um, I, I want to just look at, I mean, access is the currency that the government's measuring general practice yeah. on at the moment. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me um, that perhaps we need to turn to continuity. So a lot of the problems that we're hearing about at the moment um, and challenges that uh, we're thinking about might be solved via continuity. So I was uh, surprised to hear that your GP doesn't know what you do, because I know uh, that I ask that question often to my uh, patients. Um, but I think continuity perhaps is something that general practice should be uh, measured on rather than access. Um, so that was my first point, and I, I think it would enhance uh, managing complexity. Uh, because if you know your patient, then you'll know what's uh, best for them. Um, the second thing I just wanted to ask was, um, what can we learn from uh, palliative care colleagues? Um, in my role and working in the hospice environment, uh, I've seen integrated care, managing complexity, safe discharges, and doing what matters to the patient done best. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there. Um, the other things I just wanted to touch on were um, the value of virtual frailty wards, um, also unpaid carers that we've not mentioned, um, and also it was interesting for me when I worked at Greenwich and Bexley Hospice, uh, they went through a refurbishment and one of the ways that they did that um, was by um, asking social care to move in with them and build a new building where they shared the same space. So I wonder if uh, we're in the same building, we'll work better together. I could go on forever because I, I love this. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And um, before we, I'm going to just, because we're running out of time, and, I, I, and if I've missed somebody who has been waving vigorously, so there are two people. Can I take the two of you? And is there. And then if you could keep it really short and then we're going to carry on the conversations over coffee. Thank you. Morning. Uh, Nick Weston uh, from Lily. So part of the answer that uh, one of my colleagues says that our technology represents the silent voice of the service user so it helps understand what's happening in that environment. So my question really is, is, is technology part of the answer to unlocking the trust, unlocking the capacity issues, and helping us kind of 
get to a place where we've got more time to give more focus on individual needs. Okay, thank you. And if I take the second question and then um, we'll also won't forget about the learning wrong continuity. Uh, Rupa Joshi, also a, a GP based in Berkshire um, and various other roles. Um, I wanted to ask about international models and what we can learn from them. Um, so, for example, the Bert's Hog model um, mm -hmm. from the Netherlands and the yeah. Brazilian model. Okay, all right. So we have three questions. So Bert's Hog model, for those of you who don't know, is where the responsibility is devolved down to the community. I think essentially nursing teams, isn't it? Um, and they manage their own budget and they reduce the management costs and they make the kind of decisions that fit. And that's been tried in various places. Sorry. I think what I found really interesting is that um, you, you have somebody in the community that's um, trained as a nurse and does also does all the care, um, but is also trained in physiotherapy and parts of occupational therapy. So you're, you're having that continuity and you're having that one person. And what I particularly like about it is it's care, it, it's care before bureaucracy. Yeah, so they, you start they, off they by having that above them. cup yeah. of tea and, the, and the, how are you, what matters to you, and then they do the, the care afterwards. Okay. So we've got three things. Is data going to give us more time and flexibility and speak for the, the, the people? Is, does continuity address some of the questions around access and different ways of organising the community service in terms of the skill mixes? And um, uh, can that also release more time for people? Um, so, I'm going to, Sarah, do you want, you can pick Shall one I of those. I come in on uh, the continuity issue, because I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and we've known this for a very long time, the work of, sort of Dennis Pereira Gray, and uh, that, that demonstrates its value, you get better outcomes. And yet, our homework is being marked on whether we deliver on 24-hour and two-week access. And I'd love to see much more flexibility in those targets so we can have the yes, but. Actually, a lot of us want to trade off having, uh, you know, waiting longer so that we can see the same individual and build that relationship because it delivers such better outcomes. So I think the targets are a very blunt instrument and they drive sometimes worse care for individuals. Clinton, do you want to pick up on whether data can speak for you? Um, for me, data, we sometimes look at data in isolation. Data, behind data, is lived experience. And data, for me, data with soul. So how do you use that to get a better picture, but also technology? Often when we talk about technology in health and social care, technology is used uh, uh, um, through the lens of plumbing and wiring for the... <laughs> for the uh, system. When we talk about it as people who draw on care and support, it's technology-enabled lives. How does technology enable me to live the life of, i say it again, a glorious, ordinary life? And, who, and the, a different model of care? Yeah, we can learn from that. Pardon? We can learn from that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Okay. So we are down to the last two minutes, so I'm going to try and pull this together. I think, I think this did follow on, to, as I said, I, when I started, it's about when the rubber hits the road. What, what is this thing about trust? What is this about a relational working? And I think we've had some good, some good, some good examples. We've also had a, quite a lot of detail about what, what the challenges are, but, if we, but at least the conversation has started, and also about how we enable each other to appreciate how we work. Um, so that's um, going both ways and the reciprocity. I think, Clinton, do you like Mary Oliver poetry? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, I think that will be the thing that people will carry away about the, the glorious life um, that we are trying to enable. Um, I was reflecting on we need to build trust and we've had comments about the lack of respect or even lack of understanding or not even having a a place at the table, both for social care representatives, but also for the people who receive the services. But I think there's also a subcurrent about we actually have to repair the lost trust. You can't, and I was very struck that nobody is asking, uh, do, you, do you trust me? Do you trust, I don't know if, if you've ever been asked by a clinician, are you happy for me to be involved? 
Um, no, okay. So, I, you know, so there's a certain arrogance that assumes that people want us um, there. So I think something to, but who needs to do things differently? Well, I think the answer to that question is that we all do. And if we could create some space and time for conversations that um, are safe and also are honest and um, are not seen as pushing the responsibility around from us. And as I think was said, we haven't mentioned the family carers who do all the care um, and who do not get involved we're looking at dyads of care because how do you move a dyad, a carer and a patient through a system? How do you find them in the data? We can't at the moment. Um, and how do we do those kind of linkages? Because it's actually the multiple conditions of the carer that everything falls over sometimes. Um, so how do you pick that up? Um, so let's keep those conversations going. And I would like to thank you very much uh, for your contributions and apologies, really bright light. So if you were, waving at me vigorously. I didn't see you, that's not personal. I didn't genuinely didn't see you. So thank you very much and please very happy.